Hey, honey, grab the kids. How about we go catch a baseball game tonight? If that night was 1975 and the Cleveland Indians, hope that it wasn't 10 cent beer night for the fans. The next morning, this is what the box score in the paper read. Indians in the ninth. 10 cent beer night promotion. Fans erupted from the stands at this point and charged Rangers right fielder Jeff Burrows. Both benches cleared in support. Fans had continually disrupted the game by running onto the field and throwing firecrackers into the dugouts. Game forfeited to the Rangers. Two runs, four hits, zero earned run, two left on base. Rangers, five. Indians, five. Things backfired, and that's what's happening on this season of Laughs from the Past. Yep, things backfired. Welcome back to Last from the Past, Season 5, Episode 6. A lot of episodes. This is this season is historical backfires. We've gone all the way back to Genghis Khan. We've done recent as the NBA-ABA merger. This one's a more recent one, 1975. It is a doozy of a story. Everyone needs to know this story, especially baseball fans or just history fans, I guess. So I'm excited about it. Little little groundskeeping first. If you're listening on the regular old podcast app that we've been posting these on for the last two years, you're golden. Thank you for returning and listening and checking us out. We do have a new YouTube channel that just lasts from the past. So if you wanted the video version, if you wanted to see Jake and I do this, it it's completely backlogged, correct? We have every or almost every single episode up on the Laughs from the Past YouTube channel. And this episode, if you're watching on the John Boy Media YouTube channel, uh, this is baseball related, so I thought a lot of the John Boy Media YouTube channel people would get a kick out of this story. And if you want more Laughs from the Past episodes, subscribe to the Laughs from the Past channel. I'll put a link below. Bam. Jake, how you doing? I'm good, James. I'm good. Yeah, I think it's what what gave me an early laugh on this one is, you know, we have done some stuff, you know, the fall of ancient Rome, Genghis Khan and his, you know, taking over of, you know, the largest, basically, what, civilization there ever was. <laughs> and now I like that we can bring it back to 10 cent beer night in Cleveland because, <laughs> yes, it may be slightly different historical impacts, but historical impacts nonetheless. Yes, Keep hitting that mic. It's right in your right in your hand motion. Yeah. Well, you know you know I've got these damn excited hands. How's <laughs> the how's the groundskeeping going on your end? Good. Just woke up, excited. This is actually I pivoted to this story because I know we both woke up early to record this, and I was like, I want but something that's gonna be fun. So this one's fun. We like fun. And there's some background here. I don't know if the article I have, which is written by Frederick C. Bush, I like quoting whoever writes the articles. It's actually like sabermetrics.com or something like that. But some background that I know is that Cleveland at the time, all the factories just got shut down. It was like high unemployment, people like turning to booze and drugs and sadness. And I think that plays a big factor in the story. So I don't know if the writer says it, but I just wanted to put that in there. The river was literally on fire at times in Cleveland because there was so much like debris and disgustingness. That might not be the yeah. scientific reason, but that's what I'm going to say. Okay. And yeah, I think, I think the other thing, if you're not coming from a baseball background, I mean, we're talking the 70s. We're, we're talking uh, an, an interesting era of American history, you know, whether that's political for you. For me, it's disco. And and I think that's interesting because, Jim, I know there's another fiasco, which I don't know if we're going to talk about at the end, but I think it was in the 80s. They did a, a disco is dead party at one of the stadiums. And I think it's just as crazy as this story ends. They had to shut down the game, basically. So I think it's funny that we were in this time of, 
you know, sports are kind of taking off and becoming even more popular and they're trying to figure out the marketing and promotions that work for specific things. And there's going to be some misses along the way. And I think <laughs> 10 cent beer night and death of disco fall under that. Yeah. So the interesting thing about this story is 10 cent beer night, as we'll learn when I, once I get into the article, this wasn't like the first time it ever happened. It was somewhat common back then. But there's all these other things that were going on between these two teams and this game that made it crazy. So I'll just let's just get into it, all right? Let's do it. Fans of baseball in the 1970s surely recall the jingle that touted baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevrolet. They go together in the good old USA. You like that jingle? It's not bad. They brought it back in our lifetime, right? Baseball, yeah. hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevrolet. Because I know it. Yeah. I'm trying to think if that's the order, because something sounds slightly off. But no, it's it's the right idea. That's what the article says. Baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevrolet. I think maybe the new version changed it a little bit. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. Well, uh... That memorable advertising campaign debuted in 1974, the same year that a number of major league clubs believed that beer also mixed so well with baseball that it should be offered for 10 cents per cup on select occasions. When a common sense limit of two beers per person was set and fans were given chips that were good for the purchase of their discounted beers, as was done by the Minnesota Twins and Milwaukee Brewers, then 10 cent beer night was simply a nice price break for fans. So you would get a chip and that would get you two beers for 20 cents? So yeah, you'd, you'd get a chip or you'd get two chips and that was basically saying your beer that's normally, I don't know, a dollar at the time. We're trying to picture what the price of beer was in 1975 at a stadium. But yeah, if you gave them that chip, that's what you were supposed to exchange for a 10 cent beer, which we can, we already know how bad of an idea this is. Cause not only do you get chip redistribution throughout the stadium, you get people with fake chips. You've got beer vendors that don't care about chips. So oh, yeah. yeah, I mean this, this is a concept that up top when they have this original meeting for 10 cent beer night, they're like, yeah, we can contain it. By giving people chips, and anyone that's been in a situation where you know a lot of drinks want to get drank, that's not going to stop the people at all. Yeah. Well, they changed it to a six beer per purchase limit, okay? So, <laughs> without any oh. over oversight to keep fans from returning repeatedly. So, you could walk up, give them 60 cents, get six full beers. Yeah drink them, and then get right back in line and get six more beers for 60 cents. Starting to think I figured out the problem. <laughs> to place the Cleveland riot in full perspective, it is helpful to know of events from the Rangers' own 10-cent beer night in Arlington, Texas, on May 29th, in which the Indians were the opponent. In the bottom of the fourth inning of that game, Texas's Len Lenny Randall slammed his shoulder into the midsection of Jack Bromer, Cleveland's second baseman, in an attempt to break up a double play. Went in hard. Fine. Indians reliever Milt Wilcox retaliated in the eighth inning with a pitch that actually passed about six inches behind Lenny Randall's head. So what did Len Lenny Randall do to retaliate to that? He laid down a bunt to the first baseline, and when Milt Wilcox went to field it, just ran him over. <laughs> now that's baseball. <laughs> I I never seen that. Never even that's thought. Never such even a thought strong that. Strong move. Never even thought that. Wow. For good measure, he also tried to butt. First baseman John Ellis square in the nuts when they got to first. Little little, little Jimmy Tap. Who cares? We got a we got a competitor on our hands. <laughs> Tiger out of the cage. <laughs> Lenny Randall. I gotta I gotta look up a picture of Lenny Randall. I mean, anyone who bunts down the first baseline just to tackle the pitcher after he throws at your head. Some good shit. 
He was a lefty, okay. so that made it easier. Okay. Wow. Yo, Lenny Randall was the same guy who blew the ball. Remember that old blooper where the, the third baseman is blowing the ball foul? Like he gets on his... Okay. He lays yeah. on the ground and starts blowing it. That's the same guy. Cool. Lenny Randall. Uh, <clears throat> at which point, fisticuffs ensued in Arlington. Sure. And that's obvious. Yeah. Once order was restored on the field, some overzealous Ranger fans showered the Indians players and manager Ken Aspromonte with food and beer as they returned to the dugout. So it was Tencent beer night there. The fans were a little rowdy. There was a fight on the field, so they start throwing things onto the field, beer and hot dogs and stuff like that. Adds up. It does adds up. Since the Rangers were due to play in Cleveland a mere six days later, reporters asked Rangers manager Billy Martin if he was concerned that the Indians faithful might respond in kind. Billy Martin joked, they don't have enough fans there to worry about that. That was certainly true on an average night in Cleveland in 1974. 85% of the seats at home games were unsold. Only a couple thousand people came. But June 4th would be different. In response to the Texas fans' actions and Martin's insulting quip, Pete Franklin, host of Cleveland's Sportline r- program, spent an entire week on the radio whipping Cleveland fans into a frenzy against the Rangers. Oh, wow. So is we that got some like, fear-mongering going on, basically? Is that not sports radio host dream? That someone tells yes. your someone tells your city that you don't have a, enough fans, and now you're talking to your city. Did you hear what they said about us? Did you hear what that scumbag Billy Martin said about us? Five days straight on the radio, knowing yeah. they're coming back to town. I need you guys to be loud. We got to show them what Cleveland's all about. He lost his voice a lot. Well, you know, I'd I'd give a big speech about the kind of impact that we need to bring to this this upcoming game. But I know there's not anybody listening to this. So why even bother? There's not fans in this town. Back in five. <laughs> now for the weather. <clears throat> Pete Franklin. Good job. Oh, he looks like such an old-time radio guy. Love Classic that. old-time radio guy. Like the bad hair, the big glasses. Oh, it's great. He had that recipe for retaliation, and on top of that, the Indians brass added a 10-cent beer night of their own, which attracted 25,000 spectators. So, fine, we have to play in front of your crowd who's drunk off 10-cent beers? Well, enjoy this. You're going to have to play in front of our crowd who's drunk off 10-cent beers, and guess what? We're in the middle of a recession, and we got a lot of people that don't have jobs and are angry. Yeah. Yeah. Also, another factor they say is that by the June 4th, college had been out in Cleveland. In May, uh, in May in Arlington, college hadn't been out. So they were a much bigger college crowd because it was closer to the summer. Yeah, and I mean, this is... I mean, not only is this college bait now, like, obviously, but this is also, again, going back to the 70s in that time period, where... And uh, it does factor into stuff like podcasts and internet not being around. I don't know. If you lived three, four hours outside of Cleveland and you had some college buddies in a car, this was the kind of thing that you you tell stories about. You'd be like, yeah, they had 10 cent beer night in the car, so we all hopped in. We got crazy. We threw hot dogs at the players, crashed in the car, drove back in the morning. Like that is, I feel like that's half my dad's stories. <laughs> Well, your dad would have loved this. The six beer limit fell by the wayside early. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's I was saying that about the two beer limit. Never mind the six beer limit. As demand exceeded supply at the concession stands and the Cleveland Indians made the decision to just allow fans to have their cups filled directly from the beer trucks that were parked behind the outfield fences. Times are better. The outfield beer trucks were manned by young girls dressed scantily clad. Right. And after a little bit, they just said, fuck this and left. Yeah. So now it's just free beer night. That's great. 
Cur- I'm currently on the side with the fans. I'm also on the side with those young girls. Oh, yeah. At, everyone has done everything right except the Cleveland organization for not, like, tripling their security. You're soon, I hope, not going to be on the side of the fans. No, no. I think I think this comes down pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. um, a, significant no- a significant number of fans quickly became inebriated. From what? Yeah. Could have done that. And their actions soon overshadowed those of the players on the field. The fact became evident after the Rangers' Tom Grieve opened the scoring with the one-out solo home run off Fritz Peterson. Hey, wasn't Fritz Peterson the one that wife swapped? Oh, might have been. I was going to say, it's a name I'm familiar with. I don't know if it's due to baseball reasons or not. Fritz Peterson was uh, the Yankee. He swapped wives with the Yankee. Wow, this is post-wife swap. Fritz Peterson with his new wife. So anyway, he gives up a home run in the top of the second inning. Second inning. We're in the second inning. We're in I the thought second. it was going to be like fifth or sixth. Oh, no. We are just getting started. As the next batter, Jim Fregosi, stood at the plate, a woman ran into the Indians on de- deck circle, bared her breast to the crowd, and then attempted to kiss crew chief Nestor Chylock who was umpiring at third base. I do like that they emphasized it was the crew chief. It wasn't just any umpire out there, okay? She, she went for the crew chief. She was going for top brass. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't want any of these other guys, all right? Give me the crew chief. <laughs> Why do they even know that? Who cares about that? So, all right, so she tries to kiss the crew chief, Nestor Chylock. Nestor yeah. probably liked that. Oh, yeah. The Rangers took a 2-0 lead in the top of the third on consecutive one-out doubles by Jim Sundberg and Cesar Tovar, with the only disruptions being occasional firecrackers that were set off throughout the game. Sure. It comes the third inning, and you're like, all right, guys, I guess we're just going to have to get used to the firecrackers. Those ain't stopping. Yeah, and that's, that's tough. And, you know, if you've ever wondered, you get on an airplane or you go to an event and they say no fireworks... I, I think we're going to find out why soon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems pretty pretty obvious. However, the fourth inning and the Rangers' third run spurred one more fan nudity. Grieve belted his second homer, and as he rounded third base, a naked man slid onto the field and slid into second base. Now, we have a picture of that man running. He's got really mm. nice legs, Jake. It's the first picture he's we see. He's not naked. He's got one boot on. He's one sock, I believe. I wonder he if, does. like, he was getting, like, butterfingers, like, I got to get naked for a streak, and then the sock, he was about to take the sock off of you, and they're like, you're out of time, dude. And he's like, okay. Yeah. Or maybe he's got a really gross right foot he didn't want anyone to see. Or he knew he was going to slide and he, you know, he nicked up his foot before. Yeah, you're right. He he does, you know, for a picture taken from that time period, it's a good picture for him. Yeah, his it's a bis- good physique. It, his it looks biscuits like he has are hidden. body image. The, the lighting is hitting him really well. So, yeah. <laughs> good for him. They never caught that guy, they said, is what I read. <laughs> he just slid into second and he left. That's fine. Play, I play ball. I- I think they were like, well, there's only, there was only 50 security guards for 2,500, which is nuts. Yeah. So that guy is naked running on the field, signing second base. Like, do you want to catch him? I think you just say, like, fuck no. that. Yeah. He'll, uh, he'll find his way. Although exhibitionism was becoming a theme, the only hostility the crowd had displayed through the first three and a half innings was to boo every Ranger player who came to bat. That's normal. I'm surprised that they were even focused on, like, when a new player came to bat. Like, they were that tuned into the actual gameplay, not just, like, drinking and partying. Through through the third inning, I know know you're right, but, I mean, that's not that hard to do. (laughs) (laughs) The first sign that the mood was turning ugly occurred in the bottom of the fourth inning when Liron Lee laced a liner back toward the mound that hit Texas starter Fergus Jenkins in the stomach. As Jenkins, as Jenkins lay on the ground in pain, Cleveland fans began to chant, hit him again harder, hit him again harder, hit him again harder. What's wrong with that? That's just 
Human Nature it's 101. A, it's a tough chant. I mean, it's better than Gladiator Days. They're like, kill him, kill him. By the way, Hall of Famer Fergie Jenkins. And I think that's that's actually a funny and important note to this that, like, you know, this is someone who's considered baseball royalty, you know, who will, will look back on records at how good of a, a pitcher they were and, you know, how we view athletes now. And, again, flashback to 1975, Fergie Jenkins is laying on the ground writhing in pain, and there's, you know, 2,500 drunks screaming. What were they screaming? We want pain? <laughs> Hit him again harder. Hit him again harder. It's a kind Hit of hard Hit him again chant. harder. That's, that's what the drunk Cleveland fans were bringing to Fergie Jenkins. Uh, See, like, that's so many Fergie. words. Like, nowadays, I feel like it'd just be, again, again. <laughs> Yeah, right? And like how I don't know. Who you know, who who translated that? You know, was it one guy who talked to a reporter and his three friends were yelling that? That's usually how it goes. Whenever like reporters yeah. say loud boos here for Drink Harlow Stan, it's like five guys were booing crazily. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, dude. Um Oscar Gamble was also in this game. Like this wasn't, it reads like a triple a double a independent ball college game, major league players. Jenkins major remained league. in the game, but he gave up singles to the next two batters, Charlie spikes and Oscar Gamble that resulted in Lee scoring the Indians first run. Lee made it to third on a close play on spike single. And Martin had come out to argue that call. The fans, emulating their peers in Arlington, pelted him with their beer as Martin, who was never one to back away from confrontation, blew kisses to the stands. And we have a picture of that <laughs> as well. Billy Martin just blowing kisses to everyone. It's pretty crazy. That's really good. I mean, the fans were on top of the dugout. It had to be scary to be in the dugout. Billy Martin blowing kisses to a drunken, angry horde. <laughs> Got credit to Billy Martin. There's no security. It's a little nuts. They're throwing things at you. Yeah. You're allowed to be like, get me out of here. Neither team scored in the fifth inning, but two men jumped the outfield wall, dropped their pants, and mooned both the crowd and the Rangers outfielders. Yep. <laughs> Eventually, the stadium people had Indians radio announcer Herb Score implore the fans to not run on the field. But his pleas fell on deaf ears as fans continued to run across the outfield. One point I read they were just playing the game with people running on the outfield. <laughs> like they didn't stop the game for him anymore. It's pretty good. Like nor normally you see people get uncomfortable if there's like a plastic bag blowing in the outfield. But for this game on this day, oh, yeah, there's just two floating right now. Let them be. They'll get back. You know the Happy Gilmore scene where Shooter McGavin's like, go back to your shanties. Yeah. That's this. Like That's, that's very much this. That's very much this. This is golf. <laughs> this is a professional game. <laughs> Stay in your seats. In the sixth inning, Toby Hurrah tripled to drive in Grieve, who had singled, and Fergosi, who had doubled, sending Grieve to third. This gave the Rangers a 5-1 to one lead. The Indians set about recouping those two tallies in the bottom of the frame. Brohammer, Bro Brahmer let off with Bro a double. Brohammer let off with a double and scored when Lee was safe on first baseman's Mike Hargrove's fielding error. Lee advanced to second base as the run scored. Jenkins retired spikes, but then was accidentally spiked by Lee in a play on a gamble ground out. Jenkins' injury forced him from the game, and Steve Focalt took the mound. George Hendrick singled against Focalt to bring Lee and cut the margin to 5-3. So we've got a close game going on here. The next time Hendrick came to bat in the bottom of the ninth, he started a game-tying rally with a one-out double off Focalt. Aspromonte, that was the Indians' manager, sent three consecutive pinch hitters to the plate. Ed Crosby, Rusty Torres, and Alan Ashby. Rusty Torres and Alan Ashby? Great names. Each registered a base hit. Good managing. Yeah. With Hendrick scoring on Crosby single, John Lowenstein ooh, lofted a sack fly to center field that tied the game 
and the Indians had the potential winning run on second base with two outs. At that point, it became obvious that many of the fans cared more about carousing than about the game. Yeah, at some point, they lose interest yeah. in the game. Easily. That was, that, was, that was before the game. How many people do you think pissed themselves in the stands at this game? You got 25,000. You got free beer. Is it 25,000 or 2,500? Because there's been a couple numbers set. 25,000. Okay. Um, you think there's 2,500 people? Well, you said 2,500 before, so I didn't know. Um, oh. No, so, 25,000. Then, yeah, people are peeing themselves. I think only the passed out people. Again, there's, there's such little order here that I don't think it's a big pee on yourself. I just think it's a big pee anywhere. Oh. This. Yeah. Wow. How many people do you think... How many... What do you think the percentage was of peas in bathrooms versus peas wherever they were, like, you know, just in empty seats or in the corner? I would put it at 75, 25, 25. Yeah, my, I, I was thinking 70, 30, peas, peas not in bathroom, 70. Yeah, because why would you? Yeah, there's no order. If you, sucks if you're a female attending this game. You're in a new world here. <laughs> Uh, where was I? Once more, two men ran onto the field, and one of them attempted to take right fielder Jeff Burroughs' cap. Burroughs kicked at the man and stumbled to the ground. Martin thought that Burroughs had been taken down, and he led the Rangers out of their dugouts, bat in hand, to come to his player's rescue. Now, there's a picture of this as well, and it looks like out of an old musical fight all the players running to the outfield with bats in their hands yeah jimmy this is easily the best picture of all the pictures and i i don't know how you're how you're gonna edit this up but i mean this is what needs to be shared because it's it's unbelievable it it's unbelievable it looks like yeah i mean you said it, it looks like it's out of a musical or I was going to say, like, it looks like it was out of a real war if guns didn't exist, but, like, bats were the weapon. Like, that's what it really looks like. It looks like a brigade heading out with their bats. And it's, uh, again, it's, it takes you back, and this picture really puts you in this timepiece because it's like, whoa. Yeah. And if you go back to, there's a picture of them when they get to the outfield or another picture in the outfield, and it's just, you can see all the stuff on the field. Yeah. And they weren't lying. A lot of stuff got thrown on that field. So they were, so the Rangers run out to the outfield with their bats in hand to come to the players' rescue. As the Rangers charged, so did hundreds of fans, and the melee was on. As Permonti now led the Indians into the fray to help the Rangers fend off the fans. So now you have two MLB teams right. against drunken fans. That's crazy that the Indians were like, Let's go help the Rangers out. This is fucked. Yeah, I mean, again, and that's a good sign of how how truly rowdy it was that they were like, yo, we have to save them. I would love to know what Pete Franklin said on the radio after this. Like, we showed them or, oh, okay, absolutely. guys, we think we took it a little too far. <laughs> no, we. Pete Franklin, the radio guy, was saying we did – the best job a group of fans has ever done. You think he called the Indians pussies for not being on the fan side? Like Ooh. turncoats? Indians turned their back on us. All we were doing was defending them. Yeah, so sorry for trying to help win the game. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. That's tricky. Well, that fracas ended the game. Nestor, old Nestor was like, his game's over. Nine to nothing forfeit Rangers win. I don't know why they get nine to nothing. Is that just a standard forfeit score? I guess so. I don't know. Why didn't you just leave the score the same? Maybe there's something about players coming on the field or something, and you <laughs> that was the old rule. I, I don't know. I get the forfeit. I just don't understand why the score goes from like five to four, whatever it was, to nine nothing. <laughs> no rules. The security force of 50 stadium officers and two off-duty Cleveland policewomen, policemen and women were overwhelmed by the flow of fans and had to call for assistance. 20 additional patrol cars responded. 
In the meantime, players and fans alike were being pummeled. Cleveland pitcher Tom Hilgendorf suffered the worst injury of all the players when his head was cut by a metal folding chair that was thrown at him. I think there's a picture of that. I'm holding his head. Cop yeah. letting him out. Jeez. Um, Burroughs jammed a thumb, and Chilak, the umpire, Nestor, was also hit by a chair and received a cut on one of his hands. There's a picture of that as well. Yeah, the uh, the umpires walking off the field beat up is actually... Sad. Yeah, because that's when it's it's... I don't know. This is a fun story. You're like, oh, my God. Like, these guys... These guys had nothing to do with this, and they're getting thrown at and stuff. Like, that's that's awful. I agree. That's the one picture. The fight with the players, it all looks like cool, but the umpire walking off bleeding from the face is like, ah, oh, fuck. This is uh, pretty yeah. messed up. Pretty messed up situation. Uh, Frank Ferrone, the chief of Cleveland Stadium Security, said that 12 people were arrested and put the scale of the riot in perspective by asserting we would have needed 25,000 cops to handle this crowd. One cop per one person. Well, I think you're overdoing that, but I would hope your cops aren't that bad. Or just like a couple guns. I don't know. You see the picture of the one Rangers player with the glasses on that looks like Drew Carey? Yeah, that's that's Burroughs, I believe. That's Burroughs? Yeah. So he's the one that... Uh, he got his hat stolen, not wearing a hat in the picture. He looks like Drew Carey. He's got a little Drew Carey vibe going. And yeah, man, I am I mean, you and I, you know, again, this is normally history, but we're also baseball guys. But it's it's funny hearing baseball names because I want to say, uh, I'm wondering if that's Sean Burroughs' dad. Sean Burroughs was a major leaguer for a while. Yep, it is Sean Burroughs' dad. Um, so, I mean, imagine... <laughs> And that's that's the other thing that I've been grinning about because as the umpire picture is sad and the player stuff, I mean, just looks wild. Uh, I mean, how much these people love baseball, not the fans, like the players, like knowing that you're going to go out on a professional field and you could be attacked by a mob. There's a lot of love of baseball. So I'm that's that's kind of my win I'm taking from this story. Yo. Uh, Jeff Burroughs won the MVP in 1974. So, yeah, I mean, we've got... <clears throat> he hit 41 home talent. runs in 1977. 16-year career, 355 career on base percentage, 795 OPS. So he, he had some talent. And and that's the thing that I'm trying to put into perspective, if, if you are one of our, someone that knows baseball, but, like, picture this story and... Okay, Jeff Burroughs is Mookie Betts. Yeah. <laughs> like like it's it's insane to try to kind of draw these parallels where you can cuz it's I mean it doesn't seem real. No. Nestor Chalak was irate after the game claiming <clears throat> the fans were uncontrolled beast. I've never seen anything like it except in a zoo. Those are controlled beasts in a zoo. Yeah, those are controlled beasts. So that's kind of Yeah, it should have said like the jungle or something. Yeah. Never been to the jungle, though. Yeah. They were uncontrolled beasts. I've never seen anything like it, except that time I went to that place where they have the controlled beasts. Yeah. That makes sense, Nestor. They left the door open at the zoo. Oh, okay. Martin extolled the Indians' action, asserting, I am very proud of the Cleveland players. They saved their lives. <laughs> Those fans just couldn't control themselves after drinking that beer. <laughs> Amen. Ugh. The game marked the first forfeit in Major League since September 30th, 1971. Four years ago? That's not... I was expecting a crazy date. It's yeah. Four years prior was the last forfeit. When, fa when fans had stormed Robert F. Kennedy Stadium during the Senators' last game in Washington, D.C., before they moved to Texas and became the Rangers. Well, that's kind of oh. a cool... That's cool. That's admirable. I just want the to be Rangers part of are the Rangers are the recurring theme in all of this. Wow. The New York Yankees had been the beneficiary in that game. Both the Rangers, hurrah, and the Indians, Dick Boss Man. Dick Boss Man. It's probably yeah, Bossman. Dick Boss Man. What a name. I'm going to look him up. Had been with the Senators at that game, and Bossman contrasted the event, saying, the fans in Washington were not mean. They were only looking for mementos. 
this was mean, ugly, and a frightening crowd. Yeah, the, they stormed the last game at Robert F. Kennedy Stadium because they wanted to be part of history and grab some dirt, and the game right. result probably didn't matter at all. Grab a chunk of the fence or something. How about Dick Bossman being part of both? Yeah, well, and that's obvious. That is obvious. Dick Bossman, 11-year career. He's a pitcher, 3-6-7 ERA. 82 wins, 85 losses. Tough. Tough. Better than I. So much. How do you like this in terms of backfires? Hmm. So, I mean, who's... Okay, so who's the technical backfire on? Just the Cleveland Indians? The Indians organization or event staff? Like, whoever... Whoever said six beers per order is crazy. I think I've got it. I think I've got it. There was someone in the marketing and events and front office that was like, no, guys, like people aren't animals. This is going to be fine. We'll have a couple of the beer trucks with some of the beer girls if we need more. And it's, it's going to be a good time. And they were adamant about it. They're like, man, pe- you know, trust the people, man. And then this happened, and that person became a laughing stock forever. So that's who the biggest backfire is on. I got the biggest backfire on whoever decided not to up security and and uh, counter reps, whatever you want to call them, at the foods, the con- con- foods, foods. What am I blanking on? Concessions up the employees for security and concessions when you go from 5,000 to 25,000 they didn't up any of that yeah what are you thinking 50 security guards there's pictures like with 20 fans on top of the dugouts while the game's going on yeah I think that might even be the same guy I've, I've got I've got the events guy sticking up like we don't need extra security we don't need we don't need extra concession people. Like people are there just be slightly longer lines for people to get their couple of and, beers. And they love baseball. They're just going to be watching the game. Yeah. Trust trust the game on this one. What nope. if someone, excuse me, sir, what if someone brings firecrackers? That's not going to happen. It's what if peace they start shooting love, their, man? What if they start shooting their firecrackers into the opposing dugout? Okay, well now you guys are just being crazy. Oh, all right, fa- all right, banana lands. Okay, yeah. Let's just. What if? Uh, what if they? Uh, what if they bring a bomb? Actually, that's yeah. like a concern these days, which sucks. Yeah. Back then, nothing. Nada. What do you think you would have done in ten cent beer night? Depends what age I am. Is 18-year-old Jake streaking? I mean, college years, Jake is around the field. I'm making contact with the field. Okay. And that's obvious. Yeah. You want to be part of it. I mean, after that, I mean, maybe up to 25. So maybe it's an 18 to 25 range. I feel like I need to get involved. Outside of that, I think I'm like, oh, this is scary. I'm watching. Like, I'm finding right. an empty section and just drinking and sitting and watching. I would have been a bit of a wallflower at stadiums. I love people watching. Sure. And it sounds like a good time. There's no way I'm going on the field at any age. Too much of a pussy then and now. I think in college you end up on there. You wow. end up wallflowering, like, by the actual wall. Yeah, maybe I'll just stand like right by the foul pole and watch. Yeah, once once there's enough people on the field, you're like, okay. Yeah, I just go so, take a look. Yeah. Because you don't want to be at that event and say, I didn't go on the field. I'm also pissing myself and throwing up, probably. Probably. Yeah. I can see, if I was like an Indians fan, I could see me being the guy like, I'm trying to watch the game a little. Ooh, that's also true. There is because I'm is a big a, like I want to watch the game. If you're one of those five thousand people that would normally be at the game, oh my god, Jim! No, it's really good in this. No, the 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 I don't know if this is a not a prototype or a stereotype, but know how there's like the husband that books a vacation to somewhere beachy that 
oh, he also happened to book it during spring break. Oh, yeah, and then you have a family with all the spring breakers? Yeah. They're, they're, it's kind of that image, but with the traditional baseball fans, like, you know, should we get to a game tonight, honey? I feel, I feel like we just haven't taken the kids to a game in a little while. Let's go tonight. Yeah, that's good. Uh, that's, that's pretty funny. What if, uh, oh what if Nestor Chylock's wife was there? He gets flashed. He, the, a girl kisses him. She's pissed. Then later on, he gets beat up. I hope Nestor didn't have any family and friends watching him ump that night. Yeah, and I, I doubt he did because that's a really weird thing. That's asking your friends or family to come watch you work. That's a little odd. I mean, if, it, if you work at a professional baseball game, I'm going to say it happens often. Yeah, I don't know. Being an umpire, they travel a lot. But if they come um, to your hometown, you're like, oh, all right. If see they're that. in your hometown, maybe. But I mean, they I'm assuming they traveled every week, kind of like the players did. But um, yeah, well, I'll hope Nestor's family wasn't there. Maybe Nestor had a, a, a girlfriend in every city he went to. He was the crew chief after all. He was the crew chief. Did you see? And this is the last picture in the slideshow. There's a woman being pulled off the field by the police who just wanted to give out free kisses. I think she's the one that tried she, to kiss Nestor. Yeah, she's the one that flashed everyone and and tried to give out free kisses. But, uh, yeah, you don't really want to be flashed. Like, I'm interested if in being flashed by her, for sure, but that can go for right. every human on the earth. Yeah, it's not an exciting flash, no, but... No, no, no. Look how happy she is, though. Good for her. Oh, yeah, she's drunk, man. Happiness is key. It is. This one fan, his shirt is so weird. He got all he's all cut up in the face. That he's got cut up on the eye. Yeah. That shirt just looks like he owned that from the nineteen fifties until nineteen seventy five. Yeah, it's funny because we do have a lot of images of drunk people. That's a drunk picture. Yeah, that guy's like, oh. <laughs> that guy is that guy is hammered. Like this guy, not, he's not in the college student section. This guy's the guy that got laid off at the factory. <laughs> yeah. This this guy he this is this is the guy that got riled up by the sports radio guy. And this the security guard holding him back looks like Babe Ruth. Wait, did those You're telling me those Texas guys said we're not as good of fans as them? I've been a fan since 1950. I'm going to get angry drunk. The two cops or security guards, one looks like Babe Ruth, a good Babe Ruth, and the other is so old. Like this this old guy counting as yeah. one of the 50 security guards? No, he doesn't. He doesn't count. That's, <laughs> that's, now you see why they said they needed a body on a body. Because yeah, you got fucking 80-year-old men trying to rile up a, a riot. Ugh. Like that dude. that dude hung it up after this. Let's go through some pictures. I'll put them on the screen on YouTube. So this picture has a fan on the ground, and I don't know who this player is, number 21 for the Rangers. He's throwing shots at the dude's head. Oh, yeah. We've we've got a fan that's just getting beat up, and Matthew McConaughey in the background. I want to find out who that player is. Matthew it might Mc be Hunter Pence. Look at that guy. They don't have yeah, a, that's I don't know, a baseball ref. References doesn't have, like, uniform numbers. It's tough. There's one other picture that is Hunter Pence in the background there. Yeah. And there's one other picture of, like, I think it's that same fan. And oh, you think it's a before and after? Yeah, I think, I, think it's, I think we're looking at the before now. Yeah, for sure. So number 21 yeah. is this dude on the, on the right, this short dude. Look at the cop. In the background here, he's wearing dark sunglasses. It's a night game. He doesn't count. Can't see. Yeah, he's... All right, so we're down to 48 cops. What the hell? Uh, all right. That ends this one. Historical backfire. Thank you guys for listening. Like I said, if this is the first last from the past because you're tuning in on John Boy Media, uh, we have a back catalog... Uh, cat cat we have a back catalog of almost 100 shows. We have... Five different seasons, 21 episodes in season one that are just random, one-off, hilarious stories. Season two was a pretty in-depth coverage of the Civil War and the weird stuff that happened there and some of the wild stuff that happened in Civil War. Season three 
was Historical Mysteries. That was a ton of fun. Season four was Children Who Made History. There's some really good ones in there. And now Historical Backfires. We've been doing this for a while. It's a lot of fun. Thank you, guys. Uh, and we will be back next Tuesday. Bye.